We'll swell up, I think, as we start singing, but we will faithfully begin at 10 a.m. And, and Martha Jane for the third Sunday of Lent. So it's a gift to have you with us. I invite you to stand. Our opening hymn is 431. Since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Let us now confess our sins against God and our neighbor.
Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in everlasting life. Amen. Amen. God spoke all these words to Moses on Mount Sinai. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above, or that is on the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the iniquity of parents to the third and fourth generation of those who reject me, but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. <coughs> you shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work, you, your son or your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock, or the alien resident in your towns. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, but rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the seventh Sabbath day and consecrated it. Honor your father and your mother so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or male, or female slave, or ox, or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. The word of the Lord. We will read Psalm 19. Please respond at the asterisk. 
The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. One day tells its tale to another, and one night tells its tale to another. Although they have no words or language, and their voices are not heard, their sound has gone out into all lands, and their message to the ends of the world. In the deep has he set a pavilion for the sun. It comes forth like the bridegroom out of his chamber. It rejoices like a champion to run its course. It goes forth from the uttermost edge of the heavens and runs about to the end of it again. Nothing is hidden from his burning heat. The law of the Lord is perfect and revives the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure and his wisdom is against us. The statutes of the Lord are just and rejoice the heart. The command of the Lord is clear and gives light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean and endures forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, more than much fine gold. Sweeter far than honey than honey and gold. By them also is your servant enlightened, and he can get the great reward. Who can tell how often he offends? Cleansing of my secret faults. Above all, keep your servant from presumptuous sins. Let them not get dominion over me. Then shall I be bold and sound, and the innocent of the great offense. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. Our second reading is from 1 Corinthians. The message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of the world, the world did not know God through wisdom. God decided, though the foolishness of our proclamation, to save those who believe. For the Jews demanded signs and the Greek desire wisdom, we proclaim Christ <coughs> crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles, but to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, in the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Christ according to John. Glory to you, Lord Christ. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found people selling cattle, sheep, doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, This temple has been under construction for forty-six years, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. today, but with the question, why? And there's several layers of the question, why? One is you'll notice, maybe, as we're living into this, this thing called year B, which is the lectionary, the readings, recycle in year A, B, and C. They go through Matthew, Mark, and Luke. We are in Mark, and we've talked a lot about Mark over the last month or two, but you'll notice our reading today wasn't from Mark, which leaves me, first of all, with why? Because that's normally an intentional purpose when they slide something else in there because they want you to focus on it for that week. I think to begin with, one of the reasons for this week is we are midway through Lent. And it seems that they wanted us to hear a reading that sort of was a reminder, we are still in Lent, and sort of put the intensity of that reading in there in a little bit of a wake-up call, and it does. So it's sort of like we're week three in Lent, wake-up call, but there's a little bit of mercy on the horizon because the next week, actually, if we had the colors here, it would be um, pink instead of purple, which is this kind of break from Lent, just a little bit. It's like a little shadow of Easter coming. And uh, the reading for next week is John 3.16, for God so loved the world. So hope is coming. Easter and Holy Week and Resurrection, it's coming. But this week, we have sort of this heavy reading. So that's the first layer of why, is why Mark and John were switched. But the second layer is more... Why? Why this story? And I don't mean why this story today. I mean, why did Jesus do this? It's an intense story. It's different than the ones that we're used to. When I think about Jesus, um, I don't know about all of you, but there is sort of the Sunday school version, uh, which, which should sit near and dear to our hearts, which is, you know, Jesus perhaps welcoming the children to him. Jesus is the gentle, the meek. Jesus is the good shepherd calling, going after the one sheep and leaving the 99. Jesus saying, come to me, all who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. We think of Jesus so often as the comforter, Jesus the gentle, Jesus the helping people get up, lifting people up like we heard a couple weeks ago. But I think there's something to remember, even in that more, if you will, Sunday school version of it, is Jesus was and is, and even those messages are radical. Leaving the 99, go for the one it might be comforting, but it is radical. Jesus' whole message of the kingdom of God is here. Stop your ways, turn. And it's all radical, even though we're used to a certain version of it, so it becomes less radical feeling. But this story of Jesus going into the temple, flipping over tables, creating a whip to, to get the animals out of the temple, to throw money on the floor, and then get in sort of a public argument with the Jewish leaders... This seems a little jarring, maybe a little next level of radical that, that doesn't always sit as comfortably with us. 
And there's a few things that I think help us kind of understand a little bit what's going on. And some of that we have to understand the context of the time. So the temple in Jerusalem, we have no good equivalent for something to, to get our minds around it today. I was trying to do my best with it, but it's the icon of Jewish life, the center of Jewish life. So you could sort of think, um, take the, the uh, Statue of Liberty, the White House, the Capitol building, the Golden Gate Bridge. I don't know. What are the significant icons that we might relate to that if something happened to them, we would feel deep down? Put those all together, and that is getting to be the idea of what Jewish identity and icon was in the temple. It was the center of life. Here's the thing. While it still was in the time of Jesus, without a doubt, it had been somewhat co-opted as well because the chief priests were sort of puppets put in place by the ruling occupation of Rome at the time. There was a garrison. I, I got to visit the Temple Mount a while back, and there's a, a garrison on the side where the Roman troops were actually installed in the temple. So while, yes, the brick and the stones were part of the, the entire Jewish identity and something they held on to as a sign of something bigger than their occupying situation, on the other hand, it was also a reminder of occupation. So, Jesus, and I'll, I'll say more on this in a minute, but wanted to get people's attention, there's a place to do it. Because not only are you getting the Jewish people's attention heavily, as it's their icon, you're getting Rome's too. Because their money was generated, and a lot of it was through and in this Jewish kind of identity and life based in the temple. But there's another thing going on, which is that uh, there was an outer court, an inner court, and the outer court is where Gentiles, non-Jews, could gather. And this is where all this activity was happening. So what was happening is all of this selling and money and changing and animals and all these things. Some of it makes sense because you would buy an animal to take for a sacrifice. But what was happening, it was clogging the way and distracting from the purpose of the temple. So no longer was it a temple just for love and connection of God, which is what it was supposed to be as an icon pointing towards the Jewish connection to God and Gentile connection to God, but in fact, all this chaos, not to mention everything I said before, the sort of subjugation going on, it was, it was not only creating a distraction, but literally a barrier so people couldn't even get into the temple for what its purpose was supposed to be. So you can understand with those things, <coughs> God, this will kind of rile Jesus up. Another thing that I think we have to consider is the definition of love. Again, like I started with that image we have of Jesus as sort of gentle and kind, I think we have this Valentine's Day notion often when we think of love. But as we experience in the ups and downs of this life, love is not always gentle and fun and easy. Love is often the harsher realities. It's often standing up for those who don't have a voice. It's often getting in the way of institutions, if you will. It is flipping tables sometimes for the greater Love for standing up for what is right, for justice. That is part of true love as well. So there's, there's, there's all of this, and, and one way to think through this reading and what Jesus was up to is it was showing an example that sometimes the greater love is justice, is literally creating a scene, flipping tables, getting in a way to create and, and, and separate out so people have access to what they need. And that's what Jesus was doing, was creating access to this relationship, to the temple. Yes, you could call that righteous anger, but I would call that true love, is social justice, is flipping institutions. And I am not going to presume to say what those are. I think that depends on the corner of the life and the world you live, because sometimes those tables that need flipped are in our own lives, our families. But then also broader, sort of systemic way, and the nation and the world and all of that. Where are the places that we, as Christians, show the love of Jesus by flipping the tables that are preventing others from feeling and knowing that love? Again, that looks different for each of us. And sometimes that's just looking in the mirror and thinking, what do I need to get out of the way? But there's another sort of deeper theological truth to all of this that I think we can think about. And it's the second half of the gospel reading. And that's what Je Jesus self-identified as, kind of through metaphor. Did you pick up on what that was? Jesus was in the temple, the center of the Jewish icon identity. And who did Jesus then 
um, used as a metaphor to describe him was the temple. I will rip this down and rip this up and rebuild in three days, death and resurrection. So, Jesus wanted to get some attention because he was moving his way to Holy Week, right? In the same way that we are moving our way to Holy Week throughout Lent. He got Jewish attention, he got Roman attention, but then more to the point, now that he sort of had this, he uses it a time to teaching. Think of this. The stone, the icon, the building of the temple had been a conduit for relationship with God. And, and that's not to say churches and the temple still can't be. But now, Jesus, who the incarnate Son of God, was the new icon of relationship, was direct relationship with God, being present in Jerusalem, in the temple. This is a whole nother level. So what I think I'm trying to get at, is sometimes what is right in front of you is the easiest thing to miss. Jesus was that relationship, was in a sense the new temple standing in the temple that had been corrupted and used for wrong purposes of relationship with God, and then saying, here we are, here I am. So there's this story, um, those of you who know classical music might be familiar with the name Joshua Bell. He's uh, a famous, one of the world famous violinists and can play some of the most complicated uh, violin pieces ever written for the violin. Um, incredible reputation, tours the world, has incredibly expensive concerts, all of that. Well, he wanted to try a social experiment one day. So what he did, and uh, he connected with some other folks to do this, of course, but he put on plain street clothes. Maybe you've heard this story, I heard this a few years ago. Put on plain street clothes, went into a metro station in New York City, put his violin case out on the floor and started to bust for music and see what would happen. Now, he was not just playing kind of basic stuff. He was playing the full-on Joshua Bell, most complicated pieces written for the violin there in that um, metro terminal. And there's a video that records it. Now, the week before, people had paid hundreds of dollars to see a ticket for him in Boston. This time, he got $38, which actually makes for good, <laughs> for busing, I suppose, in the metro station, but not certainly compared to what had been the case. And here's what's really special about this. People walked by. Nobody paid attention. Nobody was, was seeing what was right in front of them, listening to this incredible music. It was children that typically were the ones that noticed and stopped. And you can see this in the video. Everybody else was passing by, probably some of the same people who might have paid hundreds the week before, to see him in concert, did not see that he was right there in front of him. That, in some sense, is a picture for this story that we had today. Jesus, the Messiah, the new icon of relationship with God, God incarnate, was standing in the temple itself, and people were missing what was right in front of them. How often in our lives are we missing what is in front of us? What are the tables that are literally right here that we're tripping over and we don't feel it, we don't see it? Some of those need removed, some of those need flipped so that we can get out of the way what is causing us to have barriers in our relationship with God, with neighbor, and self, all for love. All about relationship and love. And that is now Jesus in this moment. So, I think we can think about a few different things. One, for sort of the first layer of message, what are the institutions or problems or barriers that we need to move as the people of God for the greater call of love? Think about the people who have come before us. 2,000 years of martyrs, of stories in scripture, of the Martin Luther King Jr. to You can name it. The people who have moved systems and institutions for the love of God to create a way so there's not this kind of barrier of love and understanding of God and relationship then I think we have the other layer. We have Jesus himself present with us. And how often do we miss Jesus right in front of us? And how often do we miss the things in front of us that need moved for that relationship and that connection with God? So yeah, it's a tough story. It's a, a version of Jesus that we might not love to see. And that version is the one that we probably don't love to live into is it's not always comfortable to be the one flipping tables, whether it's in your life or society or wherever those tables are. But this middle week in Lent, 
They put this reading in here because I think they wanted us to know it is not all about prayer and reflection and quiet solitude, and it is. But there's this other part of saying the intensity of the Christian faith is making space for the radical love of Jesus Christ made possible through relationship. So let's think about what are those tables that we can move as a society or in our own lives and follow in the example of Jesus so that we do not miss what is right in front of us. Amen. Amen. to stand as you are able and we'll be on page 358. Danger, violence. 
violence, oppression, and degradation. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. The absolution and remission of our sins and offenses, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. That we may end our lives in faith and hope, without suffering and without reproach, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Deliver us, deliver us, and in thy compassion protect us, O Lord, by thy grace. Lord, have mercy. In the commission of all the saints, let us commend ourselves and one another in all our life to Christ our God. To thee, O Lord, our God. Heavenly Father, you have promised to hear what we ask in the name of your Son. Accept and fulfill our petitions, we pray. But as you know us and love us, in your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, Amen. 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 Well, my friends, the peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Everybody else, if you are new or visiting, a warm welcome. If you have any questions or there's any way we can help you connect, please reach out and let us know. Here's our junior member, Gabriel, here with us today. Um, uh, announcement. So most of what you might need to see is right there in your bulletin. Um, it listed out ahead of you. There's nothing really to mention that hasn't already been mentioned in announcements <coughs> other than just to say, please... If you have space in your time, you're most welcome for some of our additional Lenten uh, journey things that we are doing. You'll also see the schedule for Holy Week coming up. Yeah, it's going to be quite a week, isn't it? Um, so mark that for your calendar. Um, but with that, I know certainly Dixie has an announcement, and then I'll ask what other announcements we might have. A reminder that there is a work day listed. It's the Saturday before Palm Sunday. That will start at 9 because we don't have a time. The more immediate issue is we are moving the church office from the back of the parish hall, the closet as I call it, to the Sailor House. We'll have our offices together, which is a great and wonderful thing. Um, we're doing that Friday morning at 9 o'clock. We need help. We have two desks and two file cabinets that will need to be brought through the sanctuary and down the ramp and around the sidewalk. Uh, and hopefully over a very short bit of grass and maybe some gravel before we get into the to the Saber House. But um, that will start at 9. <coughs> there are lots of small items, binders, things like that, that can go that will not require a lot of strength, but just somebody to help, even if just maybe still some packing at that point. Uh, boxes. But, um, and, and also someone on the other end to say, put this here, put this here. Things like that. So anybody can help. Cool. Well, thank you. Um, your help is greatly appreciated and also a beautiful thing in addition to our offices being together over there, which makes a lot of sense. We'll have space to carve out a lovely kind of nursery attached to the building. Particularly for newer folks, some might bring a little one. It's not as comfortable to leave a child in a different building and then come over. So we'll be all connected with our older kids in the parish hall, and our little guys will have a nursery space. So it's a real gift uh, to, to have that ability. So thanks to all. Are there any other announcements for the community? Yeah, go ahead, Mike. 
Well, I have to remind everyone that's been losing sleep over the fact that they want to do the firewood ministry. It's coming up on Tuesday, okay? Nine o'clock in the morning. So what business? I'm sorry, we didn't hear. Pardon me? Firewood. Firewood, firewood, firewood ministry. Firewood ministry. Oh. We're going to split wood. We're going to take it, put it up in the storage area up over here. Anybody can help. Everybody can help. You know, we, we got ants crawling everywhere. That'd be great. Okay. But anyways, I know a lot of people lose the sleep over it. And Mike, I need to tell you, they canceled the keg of beer being delivered at 9.30. I won't be there. <laughs> there we are. <laughs> Any other announcements? Yeah, Danny. Um, Alice Gerard's birthday. <laughs> it's Friday. It's Friday. March 8th. <laughs> and we're going to move an office in honor of that. Yeah. <laughs> Be the Alice movie day. Which was actually a perfect reminder. I did, thank you, I did forget to start with calling up birthdays or anniversaries. Before I do that, are there any other announcements? Yes, Alice. Yeah, I might as well come up. Yeah, come on up. <laughs> I have had an idea, which I've learned by Father John, and since I don't know who among you are gardeners or would-be gardeners, uh, there is a, a large garden that's lying fallow behind the Sarah house, and I have a vision of sowing wildflower seeds that will attract pollinators. We have to prepare the ground, but also to plant a um, a cutting garden, and that would help our altar deal with expenses. And just today, I had a third vision, a children's this garden. It sounds like revelation. And yes, another yes, vision. a children's <laughs> garden, flowers and vegetables. So there's, take a look today. It's really exciting to think of all the possibilities. So please join me. My name's Alice, and um, I'd love to have help. Thanks. Thank you, Alice. We'll stay up here. Are there any other birthdays or anniversaries to specifically mention this week? Well, let's pray. Loving God, thank you for each and every member of our community. We pray for those who are celebrating exciting occasions. We pray for those who might have challenges that you will be with them and present. Today, we specifically give thanks for our sister Alice, all that she does for us, for us and for her birthday coming up this week. Pray that you bless her and keep her and all those who have birthdays or anniversaries this week. In your name, amen. amen. Anything else? Well then, ascribe to the Lord the honor due his name, bring offerings, and come to his courts.
Our Eucharistic prayer today is prayer C, found on page 369 in your Book of Common Prayer. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. God of all power, ruler of the universe, you are worthy of glory and praise. Glory to you forever and ever. At your command, all things came to be. The vast expanse of interstellar space, galaxies, suns, the planets and their courses, and this fragile earth, our island home. By your will, you are created and have your being. For the primal elements, you brought forth the human race and blessed us with memory, reason, and skill. You made us rulers of creation, but we turned against you and betrayed your trust, and we turned against one another. Have mercy, O Lord, for we are sinners in your sight. Again and again you called us to return. Through prophets, sages, you revealed your righteous law. And in the fullness of time you sent your only Son, born of a woman, to fulfill your law and to open for us the way of freedom and peace. And therefore we praise you, joining with the heavenly chorus, with the prophets, apostles, and martyrs, and with all those in every generation who have looked to you in hope, to proclaim with them your glory and their unending hymn.
Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us be priests. Amen. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Grant us peace. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
Let us pray our post communion prayers found on page 365. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now to the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. Amen. And for our third uh, Sunday in Lent, this is part of the solemn colleagues, part of the whole church tradition. And this week it's praying for, look mercifully on this, your family, almighty God, that by your great goodness they may be governed and preserved evermore through Christ our Lord. Amen. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be on you this day and remain with you evermore. Amen. Amen. Thanks be to God. God.